Real District of the United Methodist Church of the California Nevada Annual Conference. And I want to bring you greetings from our bishop, Bishop Ward Brown. And I also want to greet you in the way that, that, that I would say, and it's kind of a call and response greeting, okay? And so I'm going to say God is good, and you're going to say all the time. And then I'm going to say all the time, and you will say God is good. You know this already. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God, God is, good. is good. God is good. I bought my own amen corner this time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I um, want to preach to you from the book of Esther. Chapter 4. And hear these words, bits of chapter 4. When Mordecai learned that all had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went through the city wailing with a loud cry. Then he went up to the entrance of the city gate, where no one enters the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. Most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Mordecai learned what Esther had said, Mordecai told him to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the others. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews, but in your father's family, you will perish. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the people to be found in Susa, and hold the fast on my behalf. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day, I and my maids will fast also. And after that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your gospel once again. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. And give me words that will bring new life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I come to you knowing that in all likelihood I'm not supposed to be here. In Grace Cathedral? <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> But I'm here today standing before you, not because I'm five feet eight inches tall, but because I stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before me. There were two little boys who loved to play by the sand lot and where sand was being dredged out of the river. And the little boys went down and they were playing in the sand, having a good time. And one day they didn't come home for dinner on time, so their mother sent word looking for and by the time they got there, they saw their two little bikes standing outside the fence. And they went in and all, they looked all around the sand and all they could see was one little boy up to his head, up to his head in sand. And they dug around him real quick and dug him out. And finally, when he could breathe, he got enough air. They said, where is your brother? And you see what happened is that sand, sometimes when it mixed with the river water, became like quicksand. And they got stuck down in there. And the sand just started coming down on them. And the mother said, where is your brother? And he said, I'm standing on his shoulders. I'm standing on his shoulders. We come here as a people who are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. We come here as a people who stand on the shoulders of folks who migrated, came through Ellis Island, who ran across borders. We come here as a people, I come here as a preacher, as one standing on the shoulders of poor folk from Louisiana and Texas. I stand on the shoulders 
of those who pick cotton in the field from Cape Sea to Cape Sea. I come standing on the shoulders of those who made the middle, middle passage nameless men and women who made it belly to back. We stand on the shoulders of kings and queens in Africa. We here, we are here, standing on the shoulders of those who sacrificed for us for such a time as this. Those who had made a way, who went without to do for so that we might be able to live and have our freedom and our life, we come standing on their shoulders for such a time as this. You might ask, what kind of time is this? This is the time when we turn on the news and we have to ask ourselves, which shooting are they talking about? Is it the college shooting? Is it the shooting in the movie theater? Is it the shooting at the elementary school? Is it the shooting at the regional center to help the developmentally disabled? We live in such a time as this, where we have to turn on our news and hear about the Zika virus, the H1N1 virus, the bird flu, and we understand we are a global community. We live in such a time as this, where it seems like we are headed at warp speed to a fiery destination, all traveling in a handbasket. Amen? <laughs> I also want to challenge the writer of Ecclesiastes when, when the writer says there's nothing new under the sun. After I watched that presidential debate earlier this week, <laughs> I'm going to say, excuse me, I don't think you've seen this yet. <laughs> as this, to becoming the people of God that God calls us to be. There are breadcrumbs left for us in scripture on how to get back to God's beloved community. One is in 2 Chronicles 7.14 that says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and turn for their wicked ways, then they would hear from heaven and I would heal the land. That means that we can come back from such a time as this if God's people become God's people again and turn our faces back to God. How do we do that in real life? What does that look like? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> what that looks like in real life for me is one of my role models, Shirley Chisholm, who when I was one years old in 1972 ran for president and I remember my mother saving a button from her campaign. And I had it on a little teddy bear in, in, my, in my room. And even inspired me to be a political science major in college. But her campaign slogan was, unbought and unbossed. Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> if we are going to turn back from such a time as this and get back to God, we have to be unbought and unbossed. When we look at the pages of scripture, we can see Mordecai and Esther living in such a time as this, where their world is spinning out of control and the people are at risk of genocide and being annihilated. And we see them in the spirit of God, their creator, being unbought and unbossed and able to save a people. If we want to be unbought, and unbossed, we have to first do one thing, and that's we have to be willing to disrupt the status quo. If we're going to be unbought and unbossed, it is not business as usual. You look at Mordecai, he sat in the city gate, ringing out, crying out, Help us, Lord! This is not okay! Where are the voices today that can say, Look, this is not we can't have business as usual. People are dying. People's lives are being taken from them. Every night, children go to bed with nothing to eat. We must disrupt good enough and say, wait a minute. No more status quo for us. We don't bow down to anybody except for God. And I decided a long time ago, although I am a, a agent of our bishop, I decided a long time ago that I was going to disrupt the status quo. 
And I decided that even if it cost me my job, as long as I could say, would you like a venti at Starbucks? As long as I know how to do something else, I was going to speak the truth for Jesus Christ. And I was going to be unbought and unbossed and disrupt that status quo because we can't keep going like we're going. And we need voices. Your voice. My voice. To speak out on behalf of those who are voiceless. We can be like Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the mothers of the civil rights movement that said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Aren't you sick and tired of turning on the news and seeing another shooting? Or we can be like Rosa Parks and said, no, 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 not today. I'm not moving and giving up my seat. We can disrupt the status quo and be unbought and unbossed, just like Mordecai sitting out in the king's gate saying, this is not right. And if we want to be unbought and unbossed, like Mordecai and Esther for such a time as this, we have to call all God's people together. This time we find ourselves in is an ecumenical time. It is not a time for you and me and the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Muslims and the Jewish people. This is a time for all God's children to come together as one. Because when the children of God come together with one focus on changing this world and stemming the tide, powerful things happen. About 15 years ago, when I was pastoring over in Oakland, yeah, it's maybe 20 years ago, okay. <laughs> I was in my mid-20s, and I was going to visit a woman who was in the hospital. She just had a heart attack. And it was late at night, and this woman was uh, Norwegian, Scandinavian immigrant, and her husband was a cute little Italian guy. They were about in their 90s, early 90s. And I went to go visit them in the hospital. And I just love them. They're like parents to me. And I show up with me. And usually, when I don't have all this stuff on, I've got my baseball cap on, and the blue jeans, and the speakers, or whatever. And I, I bought to the hospital like that, right? And I get there, and the nurse tells me, I said, I'm here to see Mrs. Bojell. And the nurse says, no, it's after this an hour. She can't come in. I'm a pastor, because we pastors have privileges, right? We, we can go in after visiting hours. So I said, oh, I'm a pastor. And she looked at that round face and that baseball cap and those sneakers and said, uh-uh, you're not a pastor. And I said, no, I mean, I really am. She's the only family that's allowed right now. And I was trying to explain to her, because I really wanted to see her, and I could see Betty's little feet uh, moving back there on the bed. And she was a small little woman, but she had a big husky voice. And all of a sudden, when this nurse is giving me the blues and not letting me in, all of a sudden I hear Betty's little husky voice come around the corner and she's saying, you can't come in unless you're family. All of a sudden I hear, she's my daughter. <laughs> and the nurse looked at me, <laughs> brown, and then looked at Betty, Norwegian, I couldn't believe what she was seeing, but what she didn't know is that we were all God's children coming together, and we shared a love for the same Christ. And there weren't a black Stacy and a, a white Betty, but we were all God's children together, and we were powerful together. And when we can come together in our world, not looking at the things that divide us, but the things that keep us together, then we will be able to be unbought and unbossed. That is what Esther did when she called all the people together in Susa and said, we're going to fast for three days. What would the world be like if for three days we all, all our children, just focused on God? Not on what was different about us, but what was the same. What if for just three days I wasn't a Methodist and you weren't an Episcopalian, but we were just all God's children? Do you know what happened the last time we did that? Pentecost! The last time people focused on the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came down, and the world was changed forevermore if we gathered the people of God. Oh my goodness, it might look like last night when God's people are working together as a team. It might look like 
fight the warriors versus the thunder. And it's overtime. When all God's people come together, it may look like the score and your team is going to lose, but if God's people come together for such a time as this, then you're in overtime. One in the And it's tied up. And the whole team is the body of Christ is working together. And then with six tenths of a second left, there comes Seth Curry. Nothing but net. Nothing but net. And the game is won for the glory of God. And all God's people could come together, focused on the same goal. For three days they came together and did nothing but get on the court, unbossed and unbossed. You see, Esther didn't use her place of privilege to be a place of comfort, but she used her place of privilege for being an agent of change. And that is what the gospel is calling us to do, to use the places and the gifts that God has given us, to know we are standing on and unbossed and be that agent for change. Now, if you want to know how Steph Curry did that last night, you need to look at his soul. Before you look at the soul, you need to look at this soul, the S-O-L-E of his shoe. Because on the soul of his shoe, he has a scripture on all the shoes he wears. And it's Philippians 4.13. Mm. I can do all things <coughs> through Christ who strengthens me. He gave up a deal with Nike because they wouldn't let him put his faith all on right. his feet. And so on all of his shoes, I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? And friends, that's the last part of being unbossed, unbossed. You have to be tenacious. You have to know who you are and whose you are. You have to be like Queen Esther and have the confidence and the faith to say, I'm going in there with the strength of my brothers and sisters beside me. Standing on the shoulders of my ancestors, I'm going in there to the king. And if I perish, I perish. But I know the one who goes with me. Yes. And I know the one who goes before me. And I know that God is with me. We have to have the kind of tenacity if we're going to be unbought and unbossed and says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to have the kind of tenacity that says, for man some things are possible. But with God, all things are possible. We have to have the kind of tenacity that Jesus had when he got up out of the grave and was resurrected because we are a resurrection people. We are a people of hope. And when you get to those situations that make you feel less strong, less able, less tenacious, you can remember Esther putting on her crown straightening it before she went into the king. And you can remember her tenacity as you channel the spirit of Jesus Christ within you to say, if God be for me, who can be against me? And then you can channel that inner five-year-old, because some of us have that inner five-year-old. It's right on the top of you. Get out. And we, we can channel that inner five-year-old that says, Look here, you're not the boss of me. I'm on God's side and I'm working for God. And if I perish, I perish. But we live our lives for the glory and to the kingdom of God, unbought and unbossed. I can imagine Queen Esther putting on her crown, remembering the words of the Invictus poem, saying, out of the dark night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I think whatever God may be, for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeoning of chance. My head is bloody, but unbowed. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul, unbought and unbossed. Or you can be like Harriet Tubman when the slaves were making their way to freedom, who said, if you hear the dogs, Keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, if you want to be unbought and unbossed, keep going. Brothers and sisters, keep going. Unbought. Unbossed. Unafraid, only bending our knee to the power.
power and the will of our God in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the words by Maya Angelou. Out, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may taught me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Out of the hut of history's shame, we rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, we rise. I'm the black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling high there in the tide, leaving behind nights that wonder of terror and fear. We rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. We rise unbought and unbought for such a time as this. We rise bringing the gifts that our ancestors gave. We are the hope and the dream of a slave. Unbought, unbought. We rise. We rise for such time as this. When God's people can come together and upset the status quo and the community of God comes together and we can be tenacious, then, friends, and only then, shall the glory of the Lord be revealed and all flesh see it together. And we will step, stand steadfast on those shoulders of those who have gone before us, of those who have sacrificed for us, in the strength and power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will stand and turn our faces back to God. And perhaps then we'll all hear from heaven and God will heal our land. But only if we stand firm, completely unbought and unlost. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. See if you can recognize who it is who's, who's there, but we're very blessed to have you today. Thank you very much. We um, have... <laughs> Dorothy Terodis, still organizing. He's been the head of our African-American Observances Committee, Black History Month Committee, and uh, great uh, gift to have you be a part of that. Introduce our friends. We are so blessed to have today... Reverend Stacy Curry with us. It, it, I, it was really divinely led because we didn't know anything about her. We didn't know her mother had been, uh, had been associated <laughs> with the <laughs> church. Yeah. Really, I mean, it was, it was, I just, I, we knew that she had been with Joan. Mm -hmm. And I had a special memory of Joan because my dear friend E. Williams uh, was, uh, had a service there, 30 one years ago, more than 31 years ago. So I thought, whatever Jones is doing, it's got to be great. <laughs> and then, uh, and I don't know if any, many of you know about that church, you know, with Methodist, I um, mean, so, uh, post, post. Mm -hmm. But now, since then, she got elevated. She was <laughs> elevated. <laughs> she, got, she got promoted to a new position. And she's now the super, the district superintendent of the United Methodist Church. So how about that? Yeah. I should have said nobody eats no, no, until no, she no no, 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 she gets, no. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Special reason. No? Come on in here. Joe so, made those beautiful asparagus little bread. Oh, oh, yeah. And guess what? They're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> and the chicken cup. That's okay. Give me a chance to go to Joe's house. Right. <laughs> but I, 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 we're, we're grateful to uh, Randall. This is the first time, and I've been a member here. Joe has been a member. Where's Dorothy Bates? Dorothy Bates, she's, she's our most senior member. She's been here since the 60s. Where is she hiding, Claire, somewhere? But I just 
kind of wanted to uh, uh, introduce some of the members of the uh, Grace, and then um, Reverend uh, Randall. Turn the lights off. Okay, the opera is back on. Now, Randall's been so supportive. It's the first time we've ever had a whole month of Black History Month here. And it's been just, we had a form. Last week we had Joe, Ron, and Richard. Richard was a fan of reading from Apple and Joe and Richard Allen and Joe and Wow. And that was it. So, we're just so happy that all of you are here and all of your friends, and uh, we'll have to take you to talk real much one day. No, this is great! <laughs> 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 Reverend Gardner, you want to say something? Oh, well, did you want to say anything about your other friends? You said you had lots of friends coming I do, here, so. I do have lots of friends. today. Um, Reverend Gardner, 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 Reverend Gardner,